I just invited Chris to join me. My name's Tony Maritato. I'm a physical therapist here in Middletown, Ohio. And one of my passions is to help individuals recover following a total knee replacement. Now, the truth is, I love treating all patients. So it's not just patients after a knee replacement. But over the last 10 years or so in private practice, I've really just focused all my time and effort specifically on knee replacement because I think there's so much lacking out there in the rehab community. Um, clinicians are great, therapists are great, patients are working their hardest, but there's just a disconnect between what the patient wants to do. It's inviting you to watch but not join. Can you ask me to join? Like, can you ask to join on your end? And if not, you know what? You get the night off, right? You get to go home, you get to enjoy dinner with your wife and family, and you get to pack for your trip coming up. So, Chris, don't worry about it. We'll figure it out. Okay. No biggies. Um, that's what happens. That's live, right? Go enjoy the rest of your night. I'm going to carry on anyway, and uh, hopefully I can get a couple people on here to ask some questions and, and we can share some ideas in the meantime. Chris, we'll catch up next week. Don't worry about it at all. Thanks for trying. Uh, if anybody else is watching, I know there's a couple of you on here. Feel free, if you have an option to come on with me, feel free to, uh, usually there's an icon somewhere on there that says, you know, asked to be invited on. I'd love to connect with you, talk to you, answer questions in real time. But in the meantime, I'm gonna take a step back. I'm gonna look at some of the questions that were asked in the group already. Uh, no, go home, seriously. You had a long day, go relax, but do what works best for you. So recently I've been posting videos from an individual who's in the clinic with me. And the main goal for me, and the reason why I share those videos with you guys is, not because anything that I do is special or different. It's, it's just to give you a chance to be a fly on the wall in another clinic. You know, one of the biggest drawbacks, I think, to the profession, I love physical therapy and I love what I do, but I think the biggest challenge is when you're the patient, you have no idea what else is out there. Most of the time, you don't even choose your therapist. Maybe their surgeon says, go to these clinics, pick one, you randomly pick one, you randomly get assigned to a therapist, hopefully you have the same therapist, maybe you have three different therapists, and you really don't have a say in the matter, you know? And, and I think about that a lot, especially when I think of myself, my family. Um, I always try to go back to, if it was my mom going to physical therapy, I would want her to choose a therapist that understands her challenge, that can connect with her, not just you know tell her what to do, but really can embrace what she's dealing with, the challenges she's facing. Um, I always say, I've got a patient right now, he's 42 and had his second knee replacement. I've got another patient who's in their 70s and they're on their first knee replacement. Those two patients, really in some cases could benefit from very different therapists. You know, I, I kind of pride myself hopefully on being more of a chameleon and being able, able to work with different people, but I've got associates who are just hardcore, you know, drill sergeant type therapists. And then I've got other associates who are more one-on-one uh, -on -one and conversational and you might do two exercises in an hour but they're, they're gonna get to know everything about you, your family, your history, your, your pets, and, and they're the fleas on their backs. You know, they're just gonna know everything about you. So it's really important that when you're looking at not just your surgeon, like everybody understands, well, I'm gonna interview the surgeon, pick the surgeon. Um, you also wanna be able to p pick your rehab team and, and you have the right to do that anywhere in the US. I'm not so sure abroad, things are a little bit different. 
So Kathy was saying, I'm almost eight months out, found uh, your posts and videos very helpful, always learning. Thank you so much. You know, I, I kind of took a hiatus off of posting new videos for a while, but now you see the context content is coming back. And my goal is really just to give you guys information. Obviously, I can't make specific recommendations. Obviously, I've never assessed you. I don't know you. It's the internet. Um, but what I hope to do is sprinkle ideas out there that you could see, take back to your therapist or whomever you're working with and be like, hey, I saw this guy. He did this. You know, what do you think? You think that's something we can do or should do? Um, some of it might seem totally off the wall and that's okay. Some of it might be right in your wheelhouse and that's even better. So one of the questions that came up, so everything I've been posting and I've got two more videos specific to flexion that I've been sharing. But I was recently asked today, what about extension? What's the best way to work on extension? Now I have some old videos uh, on YouTube about it, but the, the important thing is first to put it into context. So in my world, now granted, I'm the first one to admit, I have not had a total knee replacement. I can only imagine and try to empathize what you're dealing with. Um, but what I do have that you don't have is exposure to hundreds of individuals from all walks of life, all shapes and sizes, all age groups who have had knee replacements. Some went incredibly easy, some went incredibly challenging, and I've gotten a chance to really kind of see and widen the scope of what I understand the challenges people face. And so with that, um, when somebody's looking at extension and they're feeling like they're not getting enough extension, for example, flexion is the same way, you know, we try to put it into context. And so my first question, I think like Eric's on here, he's a great therapist, there's lots of therapists in here. We always take it back to function. Patients have a tendency to focus or fixate on the goniometer and the numbers. But truthfully, like I've been doing this close to two decades, I don't even trust myself to get within five degrees measuring the same person on the same day during the same session. So to, to see a three degree, five degree difference, visit to visit, week to week, I would say it's well within the margin of error. What I would be looking at is, are you able to, to get off the toilet? Are you able to you know, put on your pants, to tie your shoelaces, to do the things functionally that you wanna do? And if you're not, range of motion doesn't matter at all. It's how can we get you to do the things you wanna do? So one of the questions was, an individual was about three to five degrees shy of full extension. Full extension usually would be considered zero degrees, so totally straight. Um, and if you're looking at three to five degrees, I mean, that's minimal limitation. Uh, but certainly, it could affect your walking. Certainly, it could affect your low back, and it could work its way up and down the chain to cause other problems. So we want to optimize the range of motion to the best of our ability. So let's talk about ways that we can improve extension specifically. Now, essentially there's two, two options, right? So if this is my knee, everybody understands this is flexion when your knee bends, this is extension. The conventional mode of working to improve extension is if your knee is slightly flexed, people tend to wanna push down on the knee, thinking that, well, if I push down, it's gonna straighten. While to a certain degree that's true, I would say that very rarely in day-to-day -day life do we ever have a force pushing this way against the knee. And when we do, there's a natural reactive, like almost like a reflexive response to flex the knee to protect it from going into hyperextension. So while most therapists, and, and I do it, I'm, I'm not saying it's wrong, but most clinicians have a tendency to want to press down either above, below, on both sides of the knee. I find that in clinical practice, if I can grab the foot and from the foot I can pull to create a little bit of traction, very gentle, very easy, but you can understand mechanically that if I pull, the knee is naturally going to drop down into extension. 
And so if that's the case, you know, we want to minimize, eliminate any kind of guarding or reaction. So if I do something that causes pain, the first response in, in anybody's body is to tense. If I poke you in the ribs, you tense and you pull away. That's our normal protective response. So if, if you or I or anybody tries to push the knee down into extension, our response is to flex, to fight it, to combat that. But if we kind of get a little sneaky with it and we come in and we tend to pull into extension gently, the, the brain and the nervous system doesn't fear that sensation. And so with that, it tends to relax and reduce the, the normal guarding response we would see. And so how do you do that? It could be as simple as propping your heel up on something and then as you move your body away, it will naturally pull a little bit into extension. I've got videos and you can go to the YouTube channel where I have a strap that's hanging off the doorknob. The strap is just a big loop. I rest my heel in the loop of the strap and as I slide my chair away, the strap gently pulls at the ankle to produce that level of extension again. Certainly there's, you know, you saw my video today where I had the individual laying on his stomach. Just that alone is enough to work on your extension. But again, I find that that position tends to promote more of a reflexive guarding response. It tends to tighten the hamstrings and, and the muscles behind the upper thigh and the lower leg. So, you know, you just have to experiment. There is no secret recipe. If there was, life would be so much easier for us because we could pretty much, you know, give you the formula and you would be in great shape. So everybody is different. Whether you're male, female, there's differences. Whether you're, you know, an older individual, a younger individual, depending on how long it was before you had the knee replaced, how much scar tissue was in there before the knee was replaced. And I always try to, to explain to everybody, nobody sews up a knee perfectly. If you've taken the time, built up your courage and watched any of the surgeries online, you can see when the surgeon is sewing up the knee, even if the implant, the prosthesis, like one of my goals for having Chris on tonight was to talk about computer assisted knee replacements, um, robotic assisted knee replacements. We'll do that next time. But what I would say is, at least here locally in Ohio, a lot of patients will be frustrated by their lack of range of motion improvement. Maybe they're not getting their extension the way they want or they're not getting their flexion the way they want. The therapist is frustrated and the patient's frustrated and they're battling with each other and they're trying so hard and they go to the surgeon and the surgeon says, everything looks great. What's being lost in that communication is the, the really important issue of if I was the surgeon, now I'm not, but if I was, if I saw an individual who came in, maybe there was some extensive damage and long history of pathology and instability in the joint prior to the replacement. This is a really important component. If the joint is unstable, if the joint is loose, which happens quite frequently, I'm gonna have a tendency from a mechanical perspective to wanna tighten the joint up. We have somebody in here, I don't know if she's gonna jump on tonight or not, but her surgeon told her, I put my knees in tight. Now what that means, from a combination of connective tissue and, and the size of the implant, all these factors come into play, the surgeon would rather be the knee be a little bit tighter and not have the range of motion, but be stable and strong, than to put in a knee that's gonna get full range of motion in two weeks, but in two years, that knee is gonna feel unstable and you're not gonna feel safe walking around. You know this, it's, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. You have to see the big picture, you have to step back for a little bit. So if it's a, like we've had individuals that were young, they were healthy, they were athletic, they wanna be mobile, they need to get back to work. I've seen surgeons intentionally put the knee in with a little bit of, of laxity in there so that they're coming out with 110 degrees of flexion at like a week post-op. It's just crazy how fast they get their range of motion back. But they also have the musculature 
above the knee, below the knee, they have the coordination, the proprioception, they have all the other stuff and they have youth on their side to make up for and stabilize a looser joint. But if it was my mom and you know, I know she has to walk on stairs and she has to walk on grass and she has to do this stuff and she gets her knee replaced, truthfully, as long as she can get up and down from the commode, as long as she can get on the ground to play with her dog and, and the grandkids, my kids, as long as she can functionally do the things she can do, I don't care if she doesn't have 125 degrees of flexion, as long as the knee is stable, the knee is safe, and the knee allows her to do the things she wants to do. So that's kind of my spiel on range of motion. That being said, I wanna help you get what you want. If you want 120, 130 degrees, you know, there, there's, I'm going to keep sharing strategies on how to get there. If you're not happy with five degrees of extension, you want zero, I'm going to show you strategies for that. But the, the main goal is understanding basic kind of neuroscience in, in that if I have something that hurts and I poke you with it, you're always gonna be responding with resistance. You're always gonna tighten, you're always gonna fight that. Like, it's just a reflex. There's, there's nothing we can do about it. We need it to be gradual, long duration, low intensity. You know, if you could have a therapist there with you eight hours a day, you probably get a lot more done. Um, but the harder you push, there's a sweet spot for sure. I call it Goldilocks, too little, doesn't do enough too much puts you over the edge and makes you worse you have to find that sweet spot in the middle so the last topic that I wanted to touch on for this Facebook live tonight just to kind of give you an idea of some of the stuff that we can talk about and I, I'm happy to jump on weekly monthly whatever you guys need let's talk about pain for a minute and let's specifically talk about those of you out there who are dealing with long-term pain like, I don't think anybody expects to be pain-free two weeks after surgery. But when you hit three months and you still have significant pain, you hit six months and you still have significant pain, that's where things start to change. And so this is where, even from our perspective, um, we really look at things differently from the sense that now the tissue should generally be healed. The incision should be healed, no sign of infection, no seepage, no redness, no swelling. Um, but I know that's not the case for many of you. I know many of you are three months, five months, eight months post-op. You still have excessive redness. You still have excessive swelling, heat around the joint. I wouldn't say that's abnormal. Like I, We would tell our patients, Luke, I'm sure you probably say this, 12 months is still within the window of normal to have redness, heat, swelling. But when the pain is excessive, that's, that's really where I think we need to focus. And some of what we're still learning now, you know, and, and this has changed for me dramatically, like a 180 degree difference on my understanding of pain today, as opposed to 10 years ago. Um, we need to understand that there's other factors. We need to understand that it's not just mechanical. So when you have excessive pain at three months, six months, nine months, you go in, you get imaging, they look at, at the, the x-rays and they say, well, everything looks great. Hopefully they do blood work. The blood work should rule out or rule in infection or you know any kind of reaction to the implant or the materials used. Certainly your immune system is a huge component here. I always try to explain, think of the last time you caught a cold, whether it was a flu, a virus, bacterial, whatever. What did you feel? Before you knew you were sick, it was like, oh, my back hurts and I'm tired and I'm worn out and like, why, why don't I have any energy? And, and it's, it's all this orthopedic pain. And then all of a sudden you realize you're sneezing and runny nose and you, you've got a cold. But the pain in the muscles, the pain in the joints, that starts usually before you have any idea that a flu, virus, whatever is affecting you and it's affecting your immune system. Now your immune system is a huge component to the healing process. You can't heal tissue. If I cut my finger on a piece of paper, it won't heal if my immune system isn't involved. Inflammation has gotten a bad rap 
for a long time. Inflammation is vitally important to healing. If we didn't have an inflammatory response, we'd be sick, we would die, we couldn't live as humans. So putting these into context, I'm not telling you that I have the answer, nobody does. If they think they have the answer, they just don't know that they don't know mm -hmm. that nobody has the answer. But what I would say is look outside of the mechanical parts. Look outside of you know, the, the tissue healing and, and the stuff that you would normally think. It's very easy for clinicians and surgeons and medical professionals to look at things that we wanna, we wanna look at as black and white, right? Well, here's your blood work, your white, your white blood cell count is normal, you don't have an infection. There's other stuff that could be involved. I've got a son with a nut allergy. If he's exposed to nuts, if we're not looking for the specific antibody related to that reaction, his white count is gonna be normal, but he's still gonna have an anaphylactic reaction. You know, so, so it's, the goal in this is to, to help you acknowledge it's far more complex than we make it seem. It's far more involved. Your hormonal system's involved, your immune system's involved, there's multiple systems, the nervous system. And then at the end of the day, you just went through this massive trauma to the joint you sliced open the skin, you sliced apart all the ligaments, you chopped off the ends of the bone. I mean, imagine an individual got into a car accident, forget it was a knee replacement. They got into a car accident, they broke their femur, they broke their tibia, they sliced open the, the skin and musculature all the way down into the joint. Like nobody would expect that individual to be up and walking a couple hours later. Now. You need to get up. I'm not telling you not to get up, but I'm telling you that it depends on what shade glasses you're looking at this situation. And just because an image looks normal, you know your body better than anyone else. You know that something just doesn't feel right. And I would continue to push. And, and I'm proud to say that our profession really seems to be leading the way in terms of looking outside of the mechanics. You know, there doesn't have to be tissue damage to experience pain. There doesn't even have to be injury to experience pain. There's phenomenal research out there looking at individuals who have an amputated limb. So there is no foot, yet the individual has excruciating foot pain. And the flip side, there's stories, countless stories of an individual the one that comes to mind, he steps on a nail, he's screaming in agony, he can't even take off his boot. They rush him to the ER, they pump him with all these meds, they finally get the laces off, they take the boot off, and the nail didn't even touch his skin. But yet, the brain and the body and all these systems, you know, the adrenaline and all this stuff kicks in. So, that's a long way to say, nobody has the answer. The best information comes from you. So don't let somebody discount what you're saying and just continue to look. You know, you can ask 10 physical therapists a question and you'll get 12 different answers. Luke does things different. Chris does things different. Eric, we, we all do. There's no doubt about it. Even within my practice, we all operate completely differently. But that being said, you know, at the end of the day, it's your knee, your body, your pain, you're experiencing these symptoms. You had the procedure so you could do more, you had the procedure so you could live life more, um, experience more opportunities, especially at this stage in your life. So don't let something hold you back. Just keep pushing until you find the answers. And hopefully a community like this will give you some different perspectives, you know, give you some different leads. Um, so don't hesitate to post your questions. We have people in here and I love it that are like a year, two years post-op. Um, it's awesome to see you guys still around and still interacting. You know, you're like the core family that got this group started. And I know some other groups that are out there maybe go the wrong direction with certain things, but I just, I, I wanna say thank you to all of you. I'm gonna let you guys go and enjoy the rest of your evening. 
please don't hesitate. Next time we do this, Chris, we're going to get you on. Luke, if you want to come on, I'd love to have you. Um, and, and anybody out there who wants to jump on, ask questions, show me stuff, I'm happy to give you my two cents. So enjoy the rest of your night. I will be around. Post your questions. Thanks so much for watching.